very good morning from this side grant i just introduce myself first i am atesh sharma senior editor at home crux magazine we've been covering design architecture production design home decor over a decade and have interviewed many eminent personalities with the likes of Pritzer Price director, Salon Del Mobile president, and Oscar-winning production designers uh, with uh, uh, Donald Bird, uh, your friend Dan Henna, and Paul Lee Osterberry, to name a few. So yeah, it is pretty. I'm pretty excited to have you with Home Crux today. And like I said, it's early morning here in India. I'm based in India. And the last time I woke up this early was when India toured Australia a couple of years back. Oh, really? Oh, good. How okay. are things at your end? How's the weather in New Zealand? I assume you're at the New I assume you're in New Zealand at the moment. Yeah, you've got me in Auckland here. And <clears throat> about two o'clock in the afternoon. Um, it's spring here. So, um, you know, it's the 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 Garden's looking fantastic at the moment. Everything's just springing out like it does. So, yeah, everything's good. So, yeah, we'd obviously be talking about production design, your upcoming projects, and obviously Lord of the Rings, because you can't you can't escape an interview without talking about Lord of the Rings, King Kong, and the power of dog. But I'd like to start with your childhood. Tell us a little about yourself, your early life, and the days growing up. Okay, I'll do my best. <laughs> It's a long time ago now. Um, but look, I had a really good family life and there was no sort of um, trials and traumas or anything like that. I grew up here in the same city I'm in now, actually. So, um, and uh, the city itself has grown to sort of double the size that it was back then, of course. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, as a, we, as you're aware, you know, New Zealand was like a um, far-flung sort of colony of Britain back then. We've sort of cut our ties with that pretty much now. But it's, uh, you know, it's, it's just a fairly normal, um, fairly normal childhood. I went to um, school and then graduated and went to art school after that in Auckland here. And then um, after art school, I got a job in uh, the local television station as a assistant set designer and essentially from that time which is from the mid 1970s I've been doing the same thing for the last bit under 50 years now so doing the same sort of job I'm graduated from being a set assistant set designer to set designer to art director and then to production designer so um, I've been in that world forever my whole working life. When did it first hit you that you have an affinity for design and a knack for making sets? Did you know it from the early childhood? No, not at, well. I, I always loved drawing, so I liked drawing, and um, and I was good at it. Um, I had some dyslexia when I was a kid, but I got over that. And um, but essentially, it's art and design that got me through school <laughs> and a bit of sport. Um, uh, but um, in terms of set design. New Zealand um, never had a film industry when I was growing up. Um, in fact, television would have been about it, but even then television was, um, you know, it wasn't seen as a sort of a career path per se for me because it was, I didn't have any connections to it, put it that way. I just stumbled across it when I left art school. Um, yeah, and it's a, it's a basically perfect for me, perfect for, for what I do because I like it, I like this, I like this uh, formula that's partly um, straight creative, but also the technical side of actual design and the three dimensionality of it and the uh, practicalities of making ideas physical. So, you know, the combination of all those things, working with a great bunch of other creative people, it's, um, it's a cool thing to do. So just a couple of weeks back, uh, I was having a conversation with your friend Dan Hanna, and uh, he said that you first met on the sets of Frighteners. What's the story? That was your first film, I assume. Yeah, yeah. He um, came on as the an, as an art director on Frighteners, and um, that was that was. I'll, I'll step back one bit. Um, I had been working with Peter Jackson, who directed Lord of the Rings, et cetera, et cetera. Um, prior to that, uh, a film called Heavenly Creatures, which I shot with them down in Christchurch, which is a city in the South Island of New Zealand. Uh, and then um, almost immediately after, um, Peter wanted to make The Frighteners, and we went to Wellington. That was set in Wellington, which is where his production base is and where he currently lives. 
And um, so I was looking around for an art director then who could sort of um, help me out with the with the um, manifestation and the, all that sort of thing for the design. And I met Dan. And uh, yeah, we worked on several films after that. Um, as I pretty much my working my work with Peter Jackson has involved Dan Hanna somewhere along the way as well. Since you mentioned Peter Jackson into the conversation, what was your immediate reaction when you got a call from him that you've been finalized as the production designer of Lord of the Rings? Did you know how big of a project it was and how massive it could turn out to be? Yeah, interesting. Um, look, the uh, you know obviously I'd um, I'd known Peter for quite a while then you know for about six or seven years so you know we had this sort of working relationship and I'm very um, delighted that he considered me for that job. He had been working on it for quite a while before that, the script in particular. And uh, so by the time that he got hold of me, um, you know, the the project, you could say, um, was, you know, had forward momentum. And um, when he got us down there, um, I actually met him at this, um, yeah, quite very early on. It would have been 1998 that I went down there. He was a sort of secret. The whole project was secret. So it, he didn't want to call it by Lord of the Rings. In fact, he said, come down and work on, um, I think it might have been The Hobbit. I think he said, I've got, I've got this film, The Hobbit, you know, which is another Tolkien movie, of course. And I thought, oh, that'd be really cool. You know, it's a really great piece of property to, um, great book that it was based on, things like that. And when he came down, he says, it's actually... It's a secret, but we're actually, we're actually doing Lord of the Rings. So um, that sort of hit us like a sledgehammer, really. It was a, it was, it's a much, you know, obviously, the, the, the Hobbit is a book that's about like, I don't know, an inch thick. <laughs> um, when you buy it from the shops, the Lord of the Rings is like a telephone book. You know, it's a huge um, piece of, te it's a huge story, massive, epic story. So, um, you know, just taking that on board was a um, always going to be a huge challenge. A huge challenge, not just physically doing it, but but because it's such a well-known book, it's one of the most well-read books in the world. Um, that it has like millions, legions of people who have their own imagination of what that film is. You know, what, what of what the story is, I should say. So a lot of people were criticizing us um, in the early days, saying it should never be made into a film. It's perfect as a book. We imagine it in our heads, and that's what Tolkien um, wanted to do when he created the story. You know, like um, just use keep words on the page and things like that. But um, you know, we were going to do it, and so we had to be very, very um, take the subject matter very seriously, take the book very seriously, and do our very best to um, visualize it as the book has described. You know, that's a it's trite saying that, but it's a very, very important thing to take on. And how did a film like Lord of Rings and King Kong uh, help you shape your career for the future? I'm pretty sure you were getting many offers after that. Yeah, yeah, I had a life before Lord of the Rings and then everything changed after Lord of the Rings and, um, you know, like the New Zealand film industry and my profession, my, me personally, professionally, uh, were taken seriously. So, you know, up to that point, we've been New Zealand, New Zealand designers and New Zealand filmmakers. And, and um, as a consequence from Lord of the Rings and subsequently King Kong, you know, we had a really big international profile. Um, so, you know, I personally was sort of um, asked to go overseas and um, design this, that and the other. I did go over, you know, somewhat, but I also am a family guy, you know, I'm raising a child and things like that. And I was um, more interested in working from New Zealand. If Peter Jackson can work from New Zealand, then I can work from New Zealand. That was my philosophy. Um, so by and large, my career has been uh, based around here. But, um, you know, it's been great to have been part of the sort of production design fraternity in, in internationally. Um, and it's really from Lord of the Rings that that all sort of sprung forth. You know, next we come to another film that is my personal favourite, The Power of Dog. And it is my favorite because I consider this to be the biggest cinematic uh, achievement of New Zealand. What were the references that informed your design choices for the film, considering the 1920s Montana setting? And you you were born in New Zealand. You had no idea about how Montana in 1920 looked. So what all references you looked forward to? 
Yeah, right on. Look, um, <clears throat> I've never been to Montana, you know, and uh, so here, here was a film that was sort of based there. And, um, you know, I'm sure that the um, American people who live there have expectations that it's going to be a sort of a recognisably Montana. The director and the producer um, had been to Montana and hadn't really found, interestingly, hadn't really found what they were looking for there, a sense of place. You know, it's it's all very well sort of writing it um, on a cattle ranch in the 1920s in Montana, but it was it was Montana itself has moved on over the last sort of 100 years. It's almost 100 years now. Um, and, um, you know, farming technology has changed. And um, I don't know, it was it was thought to be um, a better choice to make it in New Zealand. After all, it was a New Zealand, Australian, and I think there's some English money in there, co-production. So, um, you know, basing it here means that they, there was a sort of a known quantity, if you like, known um, crew members and all that sort of stuff. So finding uh, the right location in New Zealand actually isn't as hard as all that because New Zealand's got some really beautiful wilderness, semi-wilderness kind of um, uh, landscapes that uh, would suit suited well for the Burbank Ranch um, and uh, that the story needed. And uh, we found that uh, we actually had some various choices that we could make, we could choose them from. And um, but the one we found, I think, had a very good sense of place. And um, you know, it's beyond the fact that it had to be in Montana. I think cinematically, it needed to have a sort of a visual language that people could sort of connect with. And that's that's one of the fundaments of the design of the film is that that sort of um, that choice of location. Further to that, there was. Yeah, so oh, continue, continue. I was going to, sorry, I was going to say further to that, there's a sort of stylistic choices. You know, we wanted to have a sort of a, um, uh, I had, interestingly, I um, referenced a photographer from the from the area. Her name was, um, her name was uh, Evelyn Cameron. That's the, that's the actual book there that I, that we were referencing. And um, this, her style of photography from the period, from the place, um, was really, really important because it show it, it sort of had this isolating quality to it, you know, where houses and structures are built on the landscape where the, where the wilderness is very open and flat. Um, it tends to isolate people in the landscape and it isolates structures in the landscape. So we sort of played with that style of photography a lot by reducing, reducing things down to their essential, essential, needs in a way and likewise with the color palette reducing things down to a sort of earth tones but with um with a sort of an injection a, a sort of a secondary um rose color uh, like a red so we use sort of you can imagine dirt sky um you know dust and and dried wood and these sorts of colors with a little bit of reds and pinks and things like that sort of coming into it and it's also sort of a black and white Thing, a sort of a stark um, separation between the sort of highlights and the and the darkness, and so yeah, I mean we sort of were very very careful with our um, stylistic choices and design choices for that film. You know, in the film, the Phil Bobank's character is almost a his house is a character in itself. Can you share your insights on designing this central location and the symbolism it holds within the story? Yes, indeed. Well, look, production design is to do with symbolism and it is to do with metaphors and things like that. So our language, our visual language is just as important as the written language and just as important as the spoken dialogue from the actors and things like that. So, you know, our storytelling, the production design storytelling uses as many tools as it can out of that visual language to help tell that story. So, yes, Phil Burbank is a very difficult man. There's an underlying sort of rage in his in his persona, um, and we peel back the layers of his character, um, like an onion, if you like. We peel these back so that we can find out what that what that anger is in him, and um, and that anger it turns out to have a certain amount of beauty as well. It's love, and it's kind of like attraction and all these sorts of things. So the you know there's that sort of character story in the build in the building of our sets. And there's also the the sort of the family situation as we find it um, at the beginning of our story. This 
family eruption that had happened and that has um where the 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 original parents young family had moved out from the eastern suburbs onto that onto that um uh, wilderness of um montana set up the cattle ranch but they're very wealthy you know and they built this gigantic great big house but they had but the 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 um the intentions that they had in moving there was sort of lost. You know, they lost their way. The parents have moved out. There's a family eruption around 1900, so 25 years before the story takes place. So wanted to have a big hollow, a large, big boned house that had been sort of hollowed out. So it had very large proportions, but didn't have that much in it. Um, but what was in it reflected uh, Phil's character. He's a he's a intellectual. He's a he's a rugged, masculine man. He um he lives on a cattle farm, which is very violent towards animals. You know, when you farm animals, it's like the treatment of animals isn't like what city folk are used to. You know, they shoot animals. He he taxidermies them himself. He um he also um it's, it's in a very sort of darkened interior, so he's able to stalk around that that um that uh, interior house. He's that being the head of the house, he's got everything else under his thumb. So it's sort of like a, I like to see it as like a minotaur, a minotaur in a sort of a labyrinthine cave sort of thing. So when he stalks around, we can hear his footfalls and it echoes around the corridors. And um, so, you know, all those subtle um, metaphors, if you like, <laughs> I was trying to, trying to sort of bring to the design of the film. Yeah, I hope that makes sense. I'm sorry, yeah, I'm waiting a little bit. But, so you know. when designing an environment that's nearly a century old how do you approach a project how do you balance between the historical accuracy of the film period within the creative liberties needed for storytelling yeah good one good um yeah well look uh it needs to be unmistakably 1920s yes i mean that's the bottom line really um but we're not you know when you make cinema we're not making a documentary you know, it's not actually, we don't have to tick all the boxes and we we want to, um, uh, uh, we can use some amount of liberty to help tell the story. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of it is, a lot of it is uh, trying to get in the mindset, being able to know what the 1920s was, which is actually like a culmination of history up to then, you know, so it's not just 1920s, it's like, goes all right back to, 19, to the 1880s when the house was first made, you know, the technology is actually are earlier than that. So, we have to sort of think in those terms, but then cherry pick all those um, the uh, the right materials, the right colours, the right choice of items to go in there to compose these sort of pictures that tell this tell this sort of narrative story. So um, yeah, it's 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 partly having to be accurate, but it's also being cinematic is the is the key for me. So from Lord of the Rings and King Kong to X-Men and Power of Dog, what do you consider your personal favorite set to design? Or what has been the most challenging set for you to design that you had to build from scratch or do something out of the box? Mm, mm -mm. Yeah, okay. Look, um, to be honest, I the, 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 when you design a film, it takes so much brain power. I tend to forget projects um, um, you know, the further back in history they go. So I've got some memories of Lord of the Rings, but not a huge amount. I've got less memories of uh, being further back. Um, but there's one or two sets that come to mind. Um, I really like the Isengard, the interior of I the Tower of Isengard from the second film, or it's the first and the second film of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. It's an environment that's all been carved out of obsidian, like volcanic glass. Um, it was an incredible looking set and it's also it had a sort of a um abstract quality that was really kind of unique and new i thought at the time um another one i really liked was um in mulan the disney film mulan which is kind of more recent um we did a the emperor's throne room so that's a story from tang dynasty in china and um you know doing these sort of large scale historic Chinese environments, but with a cinematic twist to it. You know, I really like that. And the throne, the throne area and all that sort of stuff is kind of one of my more recent favorites. Um, yeah, and some of the some of those sets from The Power of the Dog, which are kind of less sort of um less showy, if you like, but 
the 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 the, the, the sort of subtleties of them. I really enjoyed the digging down into the sort of personality of these people that we talked about earlier and making things like the um the interior of the Burbank house was um I thought was very successful. So there's a few of them. You've been in film industry for quite a long time. Uh, with the betterment in technology and more CGI being used now, how do you see the role of production design evolving in the films? Yeah, yeah. Well, look, it's changing all the time. It's one thing about the movie industry. It doesn't stay still. You know, it's always pushing, pushing, pushing new new territory and new ideas and things like that. So I've lived through a lot of them. I've lived through a lot of them. I've also lived through a lot of these big tectonic changes in the film industry, the way it works, you know. So um, um, I recognise change and I celebrate change. Um, you know, I think that now, that, you know, the, 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 the last big change, of course, was um, digital technologies. And we're sort of in the, the golden years of that at the moment. And I think that we, we're looking for new territories. I think AI is going to um, be the next big thing, probably. And um, it can't be... It can only be reined in to a sort of certain extent. Do, do you think that with the coming in of AI, there's a certain fear among people, among the designer fraternity, that they might lose their jobs? No, no, no I don't think so. I mean, I can't speak for everybody. Um, I can just speak for myself and the people I work with. I see it as a as a positive tool, you know. And um, it's I think things are going to change to to um, to adapt to this technology. But you can't uninvent it, you know. You have to be able to you have to be able to kind of work with it I, and i think that our the production design and art direction and, and all the, the the sort of trades and crafts that go into the art department are innately human they're a human thing and it's um i, I just don't believe it's going to um, um um you know sort of eclipse the work that we do the way we currently do it. I mean, we've been threatened with things all the time. I mean, I remember people tell, talking about the, um, you know, CGI and vis effects and saying it's going to, you know, they're going to just do everything in computer world, you know. Um, and that was about 10 years ago or 50, 20 years ago. They were talking about on those terms, you know. But it never happened and we're still as vital um, as we were before that time. So, you know, I, I'm, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not uh, daunted by AI at all. Any upcoming projects that you're currently working on you're pretty excited about? Um, I can't talk about them at the moment. I have been working on a project for the last year and a half, um, which is stalled at the moment because of the like, the Hollywood strike. But, um, you know, uh, when that's in the can, um, that'll be, I don't know, first third of next year. And then um, I'll be looking for other work after that. But, uh, you know, the... The, the the current show that I'm on is always the most exciting for me because I have to invest so much creativity into it. So, um, you know, it's, it'll be good. You'll be able to catch up with me in a year's time and ask me about that. You're also a respected man in the designer's fraternity. What advice would you give to a budding production designer or a set decorator who's just kickstarting his career? Yeah, yeah, it's good, good. Um, look, I do advise people who are not skilled up yet to get computer skills because that's where it's at, where design is at at the moment. I usually um, encourage people to do like um, in New Zealand to do an architecture degree because it usually gives people a very good education in, in um, designing in 3D and materiality. And um, the creative creative process around color and textures and all that sort of stuff. Um, but you know, um, if the people aren't so academically minded, I would think like a uh, interior design or those sorts of things, or going to film school and doing a production design degree are all good things. But um, I think at the same time, learning uh, programs like Rhino and um, Maya and other uh, AutoCAD sort of um, systems are very, very good. Also, um, you know, there's, there's uh, more e editing programs and, um, you know, other sort of allied um, 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 computer sort of applications are a good way of being able to get in there and be useful in the art department. So I think that's the main thing. It's also being very um, uh, uh, open to fashion trends and, 
techno technological breakthroughs and um, I don't know, car design and, you know, like house design, architecture and all that sort of stuff, just kind of being involved and, and, and um, being um, open to contemporary design ideas is very important, I think. With these Hollywood strikes on, you're obviously at your home and uh, not able to work at the moment. How do you spend your typical day? What's your day like? What time do you wake up? What do you do whole day? You watch sports? You like to cook? You like camping? How's it? How's the typical day in life of Grant Major? Um, well, look, it tends to be a bit more focused down now. So first thing first, I am really sorry for that. I mean, the worst part about being a journalist is to having to deal with technical glitches. It is so embarrassing. But uh, I was just about to give the concluding remarks to this interview. But I just wanted to ask one last question that what's a typical day in Grant Major's life when he's not on the set? Um, when he's not on the set? Um, yeah, interesting. You know, it's... I probably don't think about work at all, to be honest. You know, I've got a good on-off switch. So uh, when I leave work, I get home and I'm kind of in relax mode. I've got used to that now. So I don't know. I, I've got an old classic car. I've got an old Ford Thunderbird that I muck around with, um, drive around sometimes. Um, I've got a suburban house in Auckland. So there's a, quite a big garden and maintenance, house maintenance. I quite like to do these practical sort of things with... Um, digging holes and making things and I don't know, fixing up things. So it tends to be that it's pretty uninteresting, really. But, um, you know, it's a it's a good um, alternative to the full on, fairly stressful film life that I have. So yeah, that's what I do. Do you spend time with your family, your children, your wife? Of course, of course. Yeah, my son is, he's um, left home now. So he's got, got old and left home. Um, so there's just um, my partner, Judy, and I that live in the house. And, um, yeah, we've got quite a good social scene. And, um, yeah. It's... And do, do you watch films? Do you watch movies, cinema? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sports, watch a lot of Any films. sports do you particular, that you particularly like? Do you watch cricket? Yeah, I watch cricket. Uh, yeah, I love that. And, and I, New Zealand um, is doing pretty well in this World Cup. They just lost one game to India. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah, yeah, we're 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 champions, <laughs> India and New Zealand, but India is on top, so good on you. Um, yeah, watch a bit of rugby, um, but watch you're in the rugby stuff. final as well. I I guess a week later you'll have that rugby final with South Africa. Yes, indeed, indeed, could go either way. We just don't know who's going to win. But um, he's, he's hoping anyway. <laughs> so there's a lot going in the sporting world. There's a lot going in cinema and New Zealand is progressing and so is India. What else yeah. should we want? What else do we guys even want? But yeah, it's been really a pleasure to have a conversation with you. And uh, I was obviously looking forward to give concluding remarks because it would have been really disheartening if uh, we yeah. would have just ended this interview abruptly. So uh, loads of thanks to you, tons of thanks to you for joining again. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank best, you, best, of, best wishes for that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your time, Grant. All right. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.